We are the show about ideas that matter. Hosted by global thinkers, Brent M. Eastwood and Vadim Bichutsky. Welcome in, everybody. Hope y'all are having a great week. I am Vadim Bichutsky. I'm here with my partner in crime, Brent M. Eastwood. This is episode eight of the Truth Caviar Show. Today, we're talking all about inflation and how the Federal Reserve broke our economy. So I'm sure you guys have all experienced Biden inflation crisis. I don't know about y'all, but my grocery bill has doubled since Joe Biden became president. Prices are going up on electronics, on cars, on pretty much everything. It's affecting a lot of working families in a negative way. This is the worst inflation we've had since the late 70s and early 80s under Jimmy Carter. And so we wanted to do an episode on inflation because a lot of people don't really think about or understand what inflation really means and what can happen if inflation is not contained. So we wanted to have this episode to discuss all of these issues with you today. Let's talk about inflation. So there are actually two types of inflation. There is the non-monetary inflation, and then there's monetary inflation. So the first one, non-monetary inflation. So that's inflation that is driven by changes in supply and demand. So let's say you have a natural disaster, say a drought in the middle of Iowa, crops get devastated and there is a shortage of corn. So what happens? The supply is lowered, the demand has stayed the same, and so the prices will naturally go up. That's the definition of non-monetary inflation. It's driven by changes in supply and demand. The good news is this type of inflation tends to be temporary. Once the initial disaster passes and crops are able to be regrown, then things tend to come back to normal. Another example with non-monetary inflation would be the COVID-19 pandemic. Once you shut down everything, supply goes down. Some non-monetary inflation was to be expected post-pandemic. That's non-monetary inflation driven by changes in supply and demand for goods and services. The second type of inflation is monetary inflation. This is the more concerning type of inflation. And this is caused by a loss of currency value. When the value of the dollar goes down, prices naturally rise. It's a more serious inflation that, if left unchecked, can cause economic and social destruction. The value of currency, like the value of everything else in the economy, is determined by supply and demand. The value of currency increases when demand increases or supply decreases, and the value of currency decreases when supply goes up or demand goes down. Monetary inflation can happen when there's a change in government policy, when the Fed prints a lot of money, that puts a lot more money into the economy. So the Fed's money printing can cause and is causing monetary inflation. Let's go back in history. So there was the Nixon shock, which was a series of wage and price controls along with tariffs of imports. Most notably, Nixon took us off the Bretton Woods monetary system. He took us off the gold standard, where the value of the dollar was defined by an ounce of gold. That decreased the value of the dollar, and that has hurt our economy ever since. Since then, we've seen slower growth and more economic crises. According to one study, the frequency of economic crises has doubled since the early 1970s compared with the Bretton Woods and classical gold standard periods. And so the end of the Bretton Woods gold standard has given us what we have today, rising inflation and the monetary world order where the currency, the dollar, are floating fiat money. Its value is no longer set, but depend on the whims of currency traders and the policies of central bankers. Essentially, our current monetary system gives the managerial elite and the administration state power to control our economy and the American standard of living. We've covered fiat money in episode four on Bitcoin and DeFi. So go back and, uh, and review that episode. We also covered the managerial elite and the administrative state in episode five. And so go back and check those as well. Ever since we went off the gold standard, the value of the dollar has been reduced by 86%. And that's based on the official cost of living measure, the consumer price index. Inflation is a stealth tax a way for the government to secretly confiscate the wealth of its citizen. Inflation also creates inequality. Typically, in an inflationary period, the prices of basic goods tend to increase more than the prices of, on luxury goods. And so inflation increases economic disparities and income inequality. Downstream effects of inflation include crime, 
corruption, more government bureaucracy and control, less freedom, disintegration of norms and trust, eradication of the social contract and social unrest. And so inflation, if not contained, can lead to not just economic, but social and national disaster. And we need to do everything we can to control the current inflationary period that we have in the U.S. so that we maintain our economic and military might. And one thing with the monetary supply, you have too many dollars chasing too few goods. So the national debt is getting close to 100 percent of GDP. That's all government spending. And then meanwhile, the Fed, with its money supply in the last few years, has gone up 35 percent to 20 trillion dollars out there. But the Fed and Joe Biden said this would be transitory. It would be a short period of inflation. And Biden's inflation, according to him, was supposed to break up the bottlenecks in our economy. So this was massive spending on infrastructure. Remember the infrastructure bill. This would, quote, enhance our productivity, raising wages without raising prices that won't increase inflation, he said. This will give a boost to our workforce, which will lead to lower prices in the years ahead. This is what they tell you. These are these lies. In late 2020, Fed officials predicted only 1.8% inflation. We're over 8% right now. And you can see how these bad forecasts and actual lies create bad policy. And you can trace this to case studies in Zimbabwe and Venezuela where they had hyperinflation. Yeah, and also Germany. Post World War One, the Soviet Union in the late eighties and in early nineties, post the breakup. So hyperinflation is a serious deal. Brent, I have a question. So when Janet Yellen and uh, Jerome Powell were saying that the inflation is transitory, do you think they really felt that, or, or were they lying? A little both, but I think it was more they misforecasted it. But then they also wanted to make sure that they were in step with the Biden administration's message. Okay, so they were just parroting their talking points. Jay Powell is supposed to be independent. He's supposed to be independent, but didn't Biden reappoint him? Originally, that was the promise of the Fed, is that there's going to be these experts who are independent from politics, but like everything else, right? The the reality doesn't match the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. rhetoric. In the 1970s, we had unsound money, not backed by gold, as Vadim pointed out. Then we also had an energy crisis with an oil embargo from OPEC, and this was a huge increase in gas prices, a real shock to the economy. There was a drop in the dollar because Nixon took us off the gold standard, and this led to OPEC raising oil prices. This led to stagflation. Stagflation is inflation plus low GDP growth and high unemployment, high interest rates. And then there's modern monetary theory, which we've talked about before. This is unlimited government spending and loose and dovish monetary policy and money printing. Unlimited, going forward many, many years. Deficits do not matter, but this leads to inflation. And one thing about inflation, you don't think about this. You think about it as high prices, but it also has a social construct. It damages social trust when money is no longer a mutually agreed upon unit of value. We all have to agree about the unit of value. So when it goes higher and higher and our policymakers are telling us, oh, this is going to stop and you feel it in your wallet and it's a stealth tax, social relationships can unravel and you get people who are fighting in the streets over goods. Inflation is a threat to national security. That too, that too, especially with energy. But in the 1970s, when you had long gas lines, there would be fistfights of people who were fighting over you know, their position in line to get to get gas. Steve Forbes, in his book, Inflation, he makes this point that typically when we think of the gas lines in the 70s, you know, we tend to associate those effects with the Arab oil embargo and OPEC decreasing supply. But he makes the point that actually it wasn't so much OPEC, it was the decrease in the value of the dollar that caused oil prices to shut up and created this energy crisis in the U.S., And that's just the U.S. We've also had times in history that Badi mentioned before. We had Zimbabwe in 2008 with a hundred trillion (laughs) dollar note. Yeah, right, (laughs) right. Loaf of bread was eight hundred trillion dollars. So too much money chasing too few goods. We talked about that. That sometimes can be misleading because it's an oversimplified definition of inflation because high inflation causes a change in the standard of living, too. So it's not just too many dollars chasing too few goods. I think that's too simplistic of a definition. That's like a talking point because politicians don't want to admit what they're doing to the economy and society as a whole. 
And then you have fiat money, which Vadim mentioned. So currency trading is going on too. It knocks down the dollar or it props the dollar up. You have policy of central bankers around the world and the European Union, Japan, China. So national banks are a part of this global thing. And and why don't people question it? Because they don't understand. Normal voters, they feel the inflation, but they don't know what caused it. And then we have our leaders talking about the Putin price hikes to confuse and obfuscate the right. situation. The job of the politicians isn't to explain concepts to the public. It's to protect our behinds. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, and, and so, I mean, honestly, that's why we wanted to do an episode on inflation, because we wanted to talk about these concepts to make you guys understand in depth what inflation means, its causes and its uh, downstream effects. Yeah. So we need more people to do their research and try to question what's going on and understand what's going on and vote because of that. Exactly. So since the early 70s, when we went off the gold standard, the dollar steady inflationary decline is one reason that people just starting out today often wonder why they can barely make the rent when years ago their parents who made far less money could afford to buy a house. Primary reason is inflation. Yes, your parents may have earned fewer dollars, but those dollars were worth much more. The dollar's purchasing power has been reduced by 86% since the 70s. Back in 1970. Just think about that yeah. astronomical 86% decline in the value of the dollar. It's just amazing. Not many people know that. In 1970, a Coke, Coca-Cola, cost 10 cents, and a Big Mac was only 65 cents. And the consumer price index is one way we measure that this is the print that comes out every month, and it's more of a survey of different type of prices, but it doesn't measure healthcare insurance. Healthcare insurance goes up. Oftentimes in corporations, you'll get a raise, but then the healthcare insurance will be the same amount as the raise. So a in real dollar coffee. terms, you, yeah. A cup of coffee is like five bucks. It is almost five bucks. Last night we went shopping for school supplies. School was starting on Monday. My son needed a backpack. We paid $99 for a backpack. Dude, I went to five guys and it was like 16 bucks for a hamburger. Really? Yeah. And restaurants are attacking on these like special fees that you have to pay. Uber is really expensive now, ride sharing. And, and they, they have this gas fee or whatever. But I guess prices also through the roof. Well, it's a dramatic change in CPI is what we're talking about. And CPI comes from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. And usually the Fed wants to target a rate of 2% inflation. That's considered a stable economy by the Fed. So the Fed is really failing in its mission to reduce prices. Prices are increasing over time. Demand exceeds supply. And then you'll get income inequality, which is a problem we had before inflation. So with this stealth tax, it really hits low-income people hard. And then you have a class struggle. You have politicians who forget how much things cost because they are in the bubble of Washington, D.C., where they're getting plenty of pay and don't have to worry about going to the grocery store a lot of the times themselves. And so it, it, it takes its toll on the people who are out in the Netherlands trying to find some way to survive and pay bills. Yeah. Inflation is a massive stealth tax on the public. It's a way for the government to confiscate the wealth of its citizens without them even knowing about it. There are times when CPI is around 2% where you get higher prices, but this is the result of a consumer demand if a product is popular. If people want that product, yep, it goes up. That's free market. If it's unpopular, there's lower prices. So that you can understand. The idea of the free market, right, the theory at least, is that if there's a demand for a product and the price rises, if the demand gets sufficiently high, then there's going to be a competitor born that say, hey, I want to capitalize on that demand myself. So I'm going to start a competitor to this, to this other company that's driving up the price and, and demand. And so free market works. Sometimes the entire economy has pent up demand after a recession or other shock to the economy like the COVID pandemic shutdown. So nobody, nobody was able to go into stores, businesses closed. And so when that opened up, you had stimulus checks and everybody spending money. So that was when the money supply was going up and inflation really started. Rising and falling prices are critical to enabling markets to meet the demands of people and create abundance. What is money? It's a measure of value. If something is more valuable, it costs more. And if it costs more, then other smart people say, oh, let me capitalize on this demand. Let me open up a competitor. And then by increasing competition, the price naturally comes down. And so this is why free markets are awesome. Sometimes you even have monetary and non-monetary inflation that occurring at the same time. 
that's when you get into a perfect storm. And that's kind of what the United States has experienced and other countries have too. Mexico always debases its currency. Argentina debases its currency and it's worth less. And then they have inflation too at the same time. So, so right now we have a mixture of non-monetary inflation and monetary inflation. The non-monetary part is driven post pandemic. We have an increase in demand for goods and services. People start flying more, start traveling, start making future plans. And then the monetary side of the inflation coin is driven by, by money printing from the Federal Reserve. When we had gold, we had a good barometer of the value of the dollars. So gold is relatively constant. Unless there's quantitative easing or money printing, but you can depend on the price of gold. It can go up in certain situations and down in situations because it is also used in industrial purposes and some types of, of gold use. But with quantitative easing and money printing, which we'll talk about in a moment, you have these troubles with the inflation and signs where investors will then switch to hard assets during inflation, like gold, like oil, like copper, like real estate and art, something that you can see physically that is a hard asset. Inflation is the distortion of prices that occurs when money loses value. And Goods and services lose value too, and you're paying more more dollars for that. So you're getting less food at the restaurant, and this is called shrinkflation. So that's an insidious thing too that you have to deal with. Yeah. Instead of getting a 16-ounce bag, you get a 12-ounce bag for the same price. Human psychology is another component of inflation, and this happens a lot in Latin America. That's when people expect so much inflation that it's baked into contracts and business practices and taxation. I was in Argentina in 2011, 2012, and you went to a restaurant and you had a menu that was whited out all the prices and they would write in new prices every day. The price of your meal increases while you're eating it? Yeah. Like you come in and you think it's 50 bucks and then by the time the bill comes in, oh, actually this meal that you thought cost 50 is now 78. (laughs) It's marked up again. A lot of times in Latin America, the U.S. dollar is accepted instead of the local currency or in addition to the local currency. And then you have a black market or a yeah. gray market and dollar yeah. exchange yeah. on the street. And then the authorities get involved in law enforcement and they say, you you know, you have to buy local currency at the facilities that that lend themselves to to getting the local currency. That's part of the corruption that happens when you have inflation. And I, when I was in Argentina, I had to go to a currency exchange that was guaranteed by the government and guarded by police. So you waited outside and they had it all locked. And then the police opened up the door. You went in and you exchanged dollars for Argentine pesos. And that was how you did money. But the Argentina and Mexico, they debased the currency. So let's debasing is something that happened all the way back to the Roman times where you reduce the gold or silver in coins and replace it with something that is less expensive than copper. So your money is debased. It's it's worth less in real dollar terms. Just to go back to hyperinflation, I lived in the Soviet Union in the late 80s when, when we had huge hyperinflation, when that began, the whole thing. And then that led up to the breakup of the Soviet Union in 91. And then I lived in Ukraine. And so we actually had, so the ruble was replaced by something called the Ukrainian talon. The literal translation would be the Ukrainian ticket. I remember as a kid, we had a million dollar bill, billion dollar Ukrainian talon. The loaf of bread may cost six million talons. I lived through hyperinflation. I've seen what it can do to society. Corruption. I mean, there was corruption before, but it's just created a war zone because people couldn't survive and they couldn't trust the government. Uh, We had a lot of social unrest, crime, and it was a scary situation. But what I want to emphasize right now is hyperinflation started in the late 80s. And I actually think, although I can't prove it, but I think it had something to do with the breakup of the Soviet Union. That was a big thing that led to the breakup of the Soviet Union. Often people don't talk about that. They think, oh, it was just a coup. and But you got to look at the underlying causes mm-hmm. of why the coup happened. When you have desperate people, they do desperate things. It leads to panic. And, and back then in the late 90s or the late 80s and early 90s in the Soviet Union, oil prices had collapsed too. So a lot of the revenue for the Soviet government was taken away. But in hyperinflation, going back to that, it leads to such a panic because people lose their faith in the system. They lose their faith in money. Going back to the Argentina example, people take their money out of the country and open bank accounts in Miami or other places in the United States. And the government has cracked down on this over the years and they have currency control. So you're limited by the amount of money that you can take out of the country. So capital flows are limited and you have less freedom. That's where we get into this social problems with inflation. You have less freedom because of these government 
actions. China deals with this all the time, too. But the debt that we have, going back to when I was talking about the U.S. debt, it's over 100 percent, estimated at around 127 percent and rising. And this expanding money supply with declining demand is really going to hurt. And the government sovereign bonds are not selling. So the government prints more money and you lead to situations like Germany in the 1920s. And Germany had to create a brand new currency. They just had to start all over. Going back to the Soviet Union days, that was part of Reagan's brilliant strategy to take on the Soviet Union. He didn't just want to destroy them militarily or diplomatically. He wanted to destroy them economically. He wanted to wipe out their economy. The reason why I bring this up, well, one, to say Reagan did a great job. But I think there's a bigger geopolitical lesson here. How do you take on a foreign power? People think, oh, you got to you know, start a war. People tend to think of military takeovers. But Reagan was strategic in understanding that if you cripple your adversary's economy, you can win without firing a shot. And I think China is doing the same thing to us right now. They're trying to cripple our economy. They have other means by which they're trying to cripple us. But I think the economic strategy is a big part of it. And I think we need to heed those lessons from the breakup of the Soviet Union and understand what our current adversary, China, is doing to us. China owns hundreds of millions of U.S. treasuries. So in essence, they are lending us money. If they were to sell their treasuries that they have in reserve, they could really affect the price of the dollar and that could send things into a tailspin. So they always have that option that they can do. And and that's their goal, displace the dollar as the world's reserve currency. That's been the the thrust of the matter for making sure the yuan would be top top flight. Exactly. And and without that, if we ever lose the dollar as the world reserve currency, we're we're screwed. There could be a global digital currency, too. We could talk about that a little bit later. Um, But, you know, let's kind of want to talk about the history of the Federal Reserve Bank because it's so important. And it's become so powerful over the years. But back in 1913, the National Bank, it wasn't such a big idea. The idea was originally the bank was supposed to be the lender of last resort. If there are any problems in the economy, there are bank runs, then the Federal Reserve could step up and stop that by, by adding money to the system to make sure there weren't financial panics. And then historically, it has grown to become a way to promote employment, full employment, and fight inflation. So that was a law passed in 1946 that said the Federal Reserve Bank could promote policies for stable prices and full employment. That sounds great in practice, but what is actually happening? Well, what one way the Fed regulates money supplies, they do something called open market operations. And this means that they buy incredible amounts of treasuries from banks and mortgage-backed securities, and then they create money digitally out out of the air to pay for this. And this is what's known as easy monetary or dovish monetary policy. This expands the money supply. And then sometimes they can tighten it. Uh, They tighten the money supply by selling bonds to banks. And then money goes back to the Fed and, and kind of disappears. And that's what they're trying to do now with higher interest rates. But the Federal Reserve Bank goes to the whim of politics a lot of the times, even under Trump. Trump was always on on Jay Powell to not raise interest rates. It gets very political in Washington, D.C., Politicians always want to take credit for job growth, low unemployment, low inflation. And sometimes presidents have their policies have nothing to do with this. I would argue in the Biden case, his policies have a lot to do with the way that we are in the current pickle that we are. But the Federal Reserve Bank owns 25 percent of federal debt on its own balance sheet. So that is how we finance the federal government. And the interest on treasuries go back to the treasury. So they get even more money and more money printing. So this power goes to a lot of unelected bureaucrats that work in the various uh, parts of the Federal Reserve Bank, and they are gaining more power. And that's why politicians and political leaders like Ron Paul over the years have cried out for a gold standard and ending the Fed to audit the Fed that it's been just too much powerful and too political. Now, another thing that went on a lot, especially after the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, is something you probably heard of, and I'll go through it again so you have a context to what I'm talking about, and that is called quantitative easing, or QE. And this is when the Fed buys long-term treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, very low-risk investments, and artificially, they get ultra-low interest rates 
because this lowers the cost of borrowing and gets more money in the hands of speculators and banks to lend more to lubricate the economy. So you understand that that money is out there and it's at artificially low interest rates. And this, this creates housing bubbles and stock market bubbles because the stock market looks at it and the, and the low interest rates of the economy are like, okay, there's more money out there. There's going to be more loans. There's going to be more job growth, more, more spending. And that is quantitative easing on one part. And then there's also interest rates. And the Federal Reserve Bank sets an interest rate called the federal funds rate. And this federal funds rates drives 30-year mortgage rates and different types of interest rates in the system. But just remember federal funds rates. And those are the interest rates that you read about in the news. So another way that the Federal Reserve Bank can fight inflation is that they lower, they raise interest rates excuse me, they raise interest rates and they're doing quantitative easing at the same time. So raising interest rates, that makes it harder to borrow money. And it hurts housing. Hurts housing, right? Yeah, people don't, they can't afford a house now because interest rates are higher. Their mortgage, monthly mortgage payment has gone up too. And then the stock market sells off because people are going to want to go into low risk securities like holding treasury. So so is the idea of raising interest rate is to have less money in the economy, right? Make it That's harder right. to borrow money so there's less floating money in the economy. And that fights inflation. And that so fights inflation. you yeah, have, exactly. You also right. have something called quantitative tightening which they're doing a little bit right now. So the Fed <clears throat> the current Fed federal funds rate is around 2.25 to 2.5%. That has been going up by about 75 basis points. Every couple of times the Fed has uh, their meetings every month. And so Jay Powell on Friday said the economy is not where the Fed wants to look at it. It's still overheated. So he said there would probably be another federal funds interest rate hike and the market dropped down probably around 3 percent, the various stock indices in the stock market. But quantitative tightening, OK, so you're, you're raising the interest rates and then at the same time, Instead of buying treasuries, you're selling treasuries. The Federal Reserve Bank sells treasuries and they sell those mortgage-backed securities that were on their balance sheet. And that reduces the money supply, which is what Vadim pointed out. So you keep the federal funds rate higher and then there's all those bonds. Well, each year, a bond that the Federal Reserve Bank holds reaches maturity. So instead of buying another one, they don't buy another one and they let that bond expire and that falls off the the balance sheet and they don't buy anymore. And then at the same time, what is supposed to happen is there should be a cut or reduce government spending. And that's the part we haven't done. We're spending more and we're doing these gifts, whether they're stimulus checks or cuts to how much you owe on student loans, a $10,000 cut, a rebate, okay, more yeah. money is going out there. So, so if you want to fight If you want to fight inflation, you have to raise interest rates, you have to reduce the amount of money in the system, and you have to reduce government spending. And we're not doing that. Exactly. And so Biden's so-called cancellation, quote unquote, of student loan debt, that will make inflation worse. I think so. I think people are going to look at that and say, oh, I can either pay off some of my credit cards or I can go shopping for something that I haven't shopped for in a long time. I can maybe buy a new car. Uh, I can maybe look at doing a down payment on a house, more consumer spending. And 70 percent of our economy is consumer spending. So anytime more money it goes into the pockets of people, they're going to spend more and they're going to chase too few goods and, 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 and more inflation and more government spending. That's financed by more Money printing. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the Fed has six to seven trillion dollars on its balance sheet and they've created essentially since the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, five trillion dollars out of thin air. Right. They they printed that. Hyperinflation is caused by double whammy of expanding money supply and shrinking demand. In a hyperinflation, money printing is employed as a principal method of government spending. And inflation, it gets people to take on more debt, too. They just can't afford rent. Rent is going up. They use their credit cards more. They just pay the minimum balance each month on their credit card because they can't afford to pay off the entire consumer debt. And interest rates on cars and homes go up. If you have adjustable rate mortgage on your house, that's going to go up and it increases more debt. So people can't borrow and the consumer economy suffers. Since I said before, most of the economic growth for the United States comes from the consumer 
actions, whether they buy or don't buy. Brent, I just want to trace this logic chain because it seems very logical to me. Mm -hmm. So more money printing leads to more government spending, leads to inflation, leads to more government control, leads to less freedom. That's right. This is why we're actually doing this podcast is to understand this whole logic chain and understanding the effects of what the Fed is doing and what the Biden administration is doing and its negative consequences for our standard of living and our freedoms. And don't forget more regulations from government workers. Yes. So the, the bureaucracy, last- more, more government spending leads to bigger bureaucracies, leads to more regulation, higher taxes. The Inflation Reduction Act. How many IRS new agents? 70? 87,000. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, the Democrats are like, well, we have to, we're spending so much money, we have to collect more money. So that hurts your freedom. It creates situations where you don't have the free choice. With and, your money. and if you look at the student loan debt cancellation by Biden, that money, instead of being paid back to the Treasury, is going to be printed by the Fed. Going to be printed. And we also are fearing that there could be stagflation. So we're technically in a recession. And that is defined as two quarters or six months worth of negative GDP growth. So we're in the negative GDP growth territory. But unemployment is not that high. It's still right around 3, 3.5%. So almost full employment. But that is a lagging indicator because it's based on a, a survey that the Bureau of Labor Statistics does each month. So if you pay attention on LinkedIn, you you see people all the time. I just got laid off. There is a big layoff. This corporation is laying off. So in term, we're going to f- see higher unemployment and maybe some elements of stagflation by the time that Joe Biden runs again, if he decides to run again for president. Yeah. Sooner or later, inflation leads to more government control. The scenario is fairly standard. Central banks devalue money. Prices shoot up. Government looks for ways to tamp down inflation by keeping people from spending. They also respond with price control, capital controls, higher taxes. Governments grow larger and often impose more constraints. People lose their freedoms and worse. You know, the other thing that happens during inflationary times is that banks and wealthy individuals and hedge funds, they know what to do during times of high inflation. They sell before you do. So you have your 401k or your IRA and mutual funds, and the big institutions are forecasting more inflation. They sell their risk assets, whether it's stocks or are corporate bonds or high yield bonds, and they're selling. And so the value of your 401k and IRA goes down so fast because you are not a professional investor. So inflation hurts you. Now, the rich people know that they should buy what I said before, which is hard assets. So they pull their money out. They buy more gold. They buy more oil futures. They buy art. They can afford these things and they know how to hedge. They can buy 30-year treasury bonds. So this creates more income inequality for the little guy or somebody who thinks they're doing the right thing. Oh, well, I have a diversified 401k portfolio and I have 60% weighted in stocks and 40% in bonds. I'm going to be safe. Not in this inflationary environment. Bonds have sold off. Stocks have sold off. People's 401ks have been really hit. If you're retired and you don't have any income except for Social Security and then what you have in the stock market, uh, like my parents, a lot of value. Have, you know, the stock market's been down between 15 to 20 percent this year, around 12 percent, I think it is, but go, making things worse. You don't have a job, so you're focusing on the economy and the stock market that did so well under Trump. And this is why inflation is so insidious, because it leads to higher interest rates and the stock market and the bond market hates higher interest rates because bonds go down and stocks go down. And that's what you're seeing. So it hurts people. The rich people know what to do. The banks know what to do. The institutions know what to do. The hedge funds know what to do. But the little guy doesn't know what to do. And the little guy gets screwed. All of this money printing increases the bureaucracy. And then we've seen during COVID, you get agencies like the the CDC that now want to prohibit landlords from evicting tenants who had stopped paying rent. You know, so you have this bloat in the bureaucracy that basically tramples fundamental rights of Americans. CDC has nothing to do with housing. They should just focus on science. The main take home message is that because of all this money printing, the bureaucracies get bigger and bigger and they start maneuvering into areas that they shouldn't be in and encroach on our fundamental rights. 
Yes. And all of this can create a bad recession. And so then the government says, well, should we do austerity and spend less because we're reducing the money supply? Uh, but it's shock therapy sometimes. Paul Volcker, who was the chair of the Federal Reserve Bank starting in 1979, was confronted with double digit inflation, double digit, in, well, interest rates that were around 11 percent. But he raised those to 18 percent and lending was almost 21 percent interest rates. Mortgage rates were 18 percent. How did you even own a house back then or get a car loan? I mean, there's just no way he, you had to kill the patient almost, uh, almost kill the patient to save the patient. So the patients, the U.S. economy, and the mortgage rates were so high, but that did beat inflation finally in the 80s. But I don't think American people can take uh, much more of these high interest rates. It really hurts the economy. It really affects the way our economy works with car prices, muted loans, and home ownership that drives a lot of different spending, construction jobs for new homes, people going to Home Depot and Lowe's for home improvement. All of that focuses on low interest rates. We don't have a low interest rate environment right now. We have a high interest rate environment. So if Paul Volcker would come back today, if Jay Powell would be the person who's already said it's going to take some more bitter medicine, he said on Friday that interest rates are going up on the 26th. So you, have this, so you have this unelected bureaucracy that issues these edicts, bypasses Congress. And, and so you have this facilitation of government bloat and power. Do you remember in 2021, last year, there were serious calls to expand the IRS. They were going to monitor bank accounts. Any transaction over $600 is going to be reported to the IRS, which was a violation of privacy and, and our constitutional rights. George Gilder, who published a book called The Scandal of Money, he says that the Fed's money creation and 0% interest rate borrowing threatens capitalism by directing money away from growth, creating ventures and into the social welfare bureaucracies. And so what you end up having is instead of a society based on enterprise and upward mobility, this fat scandal of money creates government dependency and is negating the American dream. Those are the consequences of all this money printing and what the Fed is doing. Another thing we can do is go back to the gold standard. And this would eliminate inflation because money is sound and stable. If you listen to our episode on Bitcoin and DeFi and decentralization and freedom of money supply, we talked about that, sound money and stable money. And you link the value of the dollar to the price of gold. And then other countries follow and they're fixing uh, the dollar to our dollar. And you have more stability. You don't have to worry so much about these huge inflationary moves. And then financial markets and house markets can be more stable. You won't have these asset bubbles. It's the bubbles that really kill people. Yes. Because the normal investors are the ones, are people who don't even have any uh, stocks or bonds, but they are getting laid off. So you have the poor getting laid off, losing their jobs. You have the middle class that are saving maybe a little bit in the stock market. They're getting nailed before they know what's happening. The hedge funds and the institutions, as I said before, they're out ahead of this. They know what to do. They're selling to save money. So if we had the gold standard, we had something that is solid uh, with sound and stable money. We could keep these asset bubbles from going up and down. Uh, the bubbles and the pops really hurt people. You get an artificial sense of wealth when your house goes up and you may be spending a lot more money, but you're going to have to pay the piper at some point. And people are paying right now with this inflation. Yes. And so inflation distorts capital markets and creates government cronyism. Inflation foments a sense of unfairness and grievance. As John Keynes himself acknowledged, quote, there is no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency, end quote. The question is, how much longer is this inflation going to last? Because we found out in the 70s during stagflation, it took several years from 1979 to, I would argue, the middle of Reagan. Nope. Middle of Reagan's first term in 1982, he was dealing with ultra high unemployment, ultra high interest rates. And this was he was Reagan had to deal with stagflation, too. And he decided to cut taxes as uh, and, and spend more money 
spend on those. defense. Well, defense. Right. On defense, but right. cut other exactly. social social programs, uh, which was unpopular. Uh, in the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher had to do the same thing. She nationalized a lot of industries and fought socialism at the same time when interest rates and inflation were high in the United Kingdom. Inflation right now is all over the place. Uh, it's in Europe. It's in Asia. A lot of countries are facing it. And it's it's bitter medicine. I mean, the only way to do it is to quantitative tighten uh, and not not buy as many bonds and mortgage backed securities, tighten that money supply and raise interest rates. But we know from what we just said, raising interest rates is a killer, too, to the economy. So we got to make sure we don't kill the patient to try to save the patient. And I think we're going to see. You know, it's amazing why they said this was going to be transitory. Any college student who has had macroeconomics and microeconomics could have told you that there's going to be more inflation. And so these unelected bureaucrats that have PhDs in economics, Jay Powell doesn't have a PhD in economics. He's a lawyer. But at any rate. Oh, he doesn't have a PhD in economics? No, oh, he's a lawyer. Okay. Yeah. How did he get the post? <laughs> Good question. Well, how, well, well, how do any of them get the post? I mean, uh, did Paul Walker have a PhD in economics? Yes, he did. Okay. Yeah. And Greenspan, I think, did, right? Mm. Right. And I think Bernanke did too, right? Oh, very much. Okay. Very yeah, much right. so. Good. Yeah. He was a good scholar. What about Yellen? Yellen's got a PhD from Cal Berkeley. Or Yellen has a PhD. She taught at Cal Berkeley for many years. Okay. Yeah. And, and so just go back to the stagflation of the late 70s, you know, mm-hmm. the Carter years. Paul Volcker, he also created sort of like a half-baked uh, gold standard. He used commodities to measure the value of the dollar, which was, you know, not exactly the gold standard, but a pretty close approximation. And so that often goes uh, unnoticed. Reagan obviously had a lot to do with that too, but Volcker was smart enough to realize that we need some sort of a standard to measure the value of the dollar. And we got a stronger dollar at that time, and it kind of forced... Uh, uh, oil prices to go back down to a manageable level. So you had you didn't have to have those long gas lines that you had in the 70s and the 80s. It was it was pretty much beaten back. But it took it was it was tough. I mean, Reagan was really worried in 1982 during the midterms. He was like, you know, if this this economy doesn't change, I'm going to be really uh, beaten in 1984. But that that expansion, the 40 year expansion after Reagan in 1982, when Reaganomics kicked in, and we had great economic growth. We got those interest rates under control and more people were lending. There was a tax cut, so more people were spending money. So we were able to have that huge expansion in the 1990s under Clinton too. Right. And a lot of that had to do with baby boomers were in their period of the the highest earning powers that they had. But the 90s was seen as a boom time, low interest but, but, rates, uh, low inflation. When Greenspan came in from like 87 to the late 90s, he was also using commodities as a sort of like a half-baked gold standard. So he took the value of the dollar very seriously as well. And that contributed heavily to the boom that we had in the late 80s and into the 90s. And then the bubble burst in the late 90s and early 2000s when we had the tech uh, technology stock problem that just dived in the rest right. of the financial and, and, markets. But, but at that time, he went off this half-baked gold standard. He put money into real estate, created all these bubbles that led to the financial crisis. And so having a gold standard or a gold-like standard is very important. Yeah. Everything um, is so uh, connected to interest rates. So people who try to forecast interest rates can sometimes do pretty well in the market. And a lot of people get market intelligence by forecasting what the interest rates are. So most people understood that in current times under the Biden administration with stimulus and an infrastructure spending and all kinds of government spending, along with quantitative easing, you're just going to have too much money out there. And couple that with the COVID crisis and supply chains affected by the COVID crisis. You know, when Shanghai, the port of Shanghai shuts down because the Chinese government is worried about COVID, you're going to get a massive backlog of orders. And then you have all the ships that are closed. They can't get into port. They can't deliver their scrap iron and then put the goods back on the container ship. And then outside of California and Long Beach, they had a lot of ships that. So I, part of the inflation has been the supply chain. Yeah. But I think that was a way for liberals to explain away the problem and just say, oh, it's supply chain. It's not our fault. Right. Well, it was Blame everything physical. on the pandemic. Right? Yeah. Like, blame like, it on and you yeah. know, blame it on Trump. It's you know, you point. have to understand this macroeconomics, have to understand the Fed. And that is why 
you know, people like the libertarians, we were talking about this coming to the podcast today, libertarian capitalism and what I call rebel capitalism, people who worry about the Federal Reserve Bank, they worry about centralization of power, they favor Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to get away from the financial system. There are more and more people who are rebels now and are saying audit the Fed, in the Fed, go back on the gold standard. More and more people, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. It used to be before the Internet. There were very few people who understood the global financial system. Now we're better informed. Now we have our podcasts and we listen to each other. Now we have our blogs and websites. And so more and more people are talking about what I call rebel capitalism and it's libertarianism, economics. And I think that is something that Ron Paul was so ahead of his time when he was talking about in the Fed and the early aughts and the mid mid aughts. When he so, was he was winning straw polls at CPAC, you know, where he was going to run for president yep. and his foreign policy kind of has problems. But I think Paul was right was on, spot on. Yeah. On about so, monetary it, policy. It, so there's an interview with Ron Paul that's floating on the Internet where, you know, he's talking about the Fed and the value of the dollar. He was talking about that back in 1988. And Reagan was talking about the administrative uh, state in the early 80s, too, or in the 70s, rather, yeah. before he was president. Exactly. Remember yeah. that famous quote about if fascism ever came to America, it would be in the name of liberalism. <laughs> yeah. Or the, the most dangerous words are when they yeah. know, somebody knocks on your door and says, I'm the government and I'm here to help. You know, don't believe <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly. Don't believe that. So here's the magic formula to combat inflation. Stable money, lower taxes, less government spending, less regulations, revive the free market. And not be so centralized with the Department of the Treasury and the Federal Reserve Bank. We have to get away from these people who are centralized planners that are unelected, that don't do a good job forecasting, that have bad policies that are based on a lot of it is nonsense. It's a lot of uh, economic inside baseball that people don't understand. I think if more people were educated, they would find out that the Federal Reserve Bank has too much power too much centralization. They've gone beyond their original mandate. They're wrong and they raise interest rates or lower interest rates at the wrong time. They do quantitative easing too long. They should have known that they couldn't keep doing that. They couldn't keep interest rates so low. It's going to create asset bubbles, going to create inflation. Now they're in a pickle. Now they're going to have to mainly almost kill the patient to save the patient with higher interest rates. You're going to see that as a big factor going forward in terms of housing and rents are going up, cars are going up, prices for cars are going up. And then they tell you, oh, you got to buy a electric vehicle. You got to buy an EV. Well, the prices of EVs are going up too. And so how are you going to afford all this? So I think that inflation uh, can be a situation where could could foment some some change here in the midterm elections if if the Republicans are able to run on this as as a political issue and and yoke it to the Biden administration and the Biden policies. They need to talk about the effects of inflation in the way that we have talked about here. Make the case that inflation isn't just, oh, my cup of coffee went up by 20 cents or whatever. There are really serious consequences to our country if we don't contain this inflation. Yeah, it's so hard to fight against. If you let it go too long and call it transitory and don't do anything for six months to a year where the CPI creeps up to the eights and the nine percent, you're going to have a tough problem trying to fight this thing and whip inflation now, as I said, in the 1970s. So we need to return. We need a 21st century gold standard. Gold simply serves as the anchor of value. Price of gold getting too high or too low, you adjust the money supply appropriately. I think that's a good one to end on. We want to encourage you to educate yourself. Listening to this podcast is going to help you. There's other rebel capitalists out there that you can listen to. Just just search for libertarian economics and you'll find a lot of people who want to go back to the gold standard. Robert Kiyosaki is one of them. George Gammon's another one. Lynn Alden's another one that you can listen to. And all these people are re- rebels. They are against some of these centrally planned policies that really hurt the economy in the long run. And uh, check out a brand new book by Steve Forbes called Inflation that just came out, I think, a couple of months ago. It's a really good explanation of inflation and what it does to societies and the world in general. 
All right. So enjoy your week. I hope you heard something that maybe jogged your interest and you get an idea of how some of this stuff works and tell other people about how it works too. The more voters that are informed about the global economic system, the financial system, the monetary system are going to be more informed voters and they're going to make the right decisions when they go vote in November. Gold standard now. Have a great week, everybody. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Truth Caviar Show. Email us at truthcaviarshow at gmail.com and let us know what you think about the show. And remember, no bias, no bull, no fear, just hard truths.